It's two o'clock in the morning. I haven't slept all night. My heart is pounding away as if it's going to come out of my chest. I suddenly get out of bed and I yell for my wife. She turns on the light and immediately rushes over. And I'll never forget, I remember looking her right in the eye and saying, dear, I think I'm going to die. And with that, my heart stops. The lights go out and down I go. She immediately calls 911. And fortunately, the firemen were there literally in minutes. Now this is where it gets a little strange. I could not see them. I could not feel them. But I could hear them. And I could hear these two firemen come rushing through the door. One went to my head, one went to my torso. And I heard the younger fireman say, sir, I cannot find a pulse. And a second later, he says it a little bit louder, sir, I cannot find a pulse. And with that, the paramedics come rushing through the door. They yell for everyone to get back. They hit my arm with a syringe. They rip open my shirt and they put the paddles on and they yell clear. I remember thinking, guys, guys, I'm right here. And then the young fireman says, stop, there's a pulse. And as I opened my eyes, the first thing I saw was this great big bald paramedic looking down at me. <laughs> and with a slight smile, he says, welcome back. And with that, they toss me in the ambulance, they yell, lights on, and they take me to the hospital. Now the next morning, my cardiologist comes into my ICU room. And he says, Michael, we have some very bad news. You have suffered a major heart attack, and a third of your heart is now dead. And as soon as we get you stabilized, we're going to transport you by ambulance to Sequoia Hospital, where they have better tests, better equipment, and better specialists. I remember that ride up, and I remember thinking, what in the world has happened to me? Five days ago, I was in the best shape of my life. I was a black belt in karate. I was married to a beautiful wife. And the most important thing, we had the most precious three-year-old twin girls. I thought, this all has to be a dream. But it wasn't. It was my new reality. Now, 10 days later, I left Sequoia Hospital with a defibrillator in my chest. Now a defibrillator is an internal device so that the next time my heart stopped, it will literally shock me back to life. So as I healed up, my doctor said I could go back to light exercise. Now I soon realized that his definition of light exercise was quite a bit different than my definition. To me, light exercise meant jogging, and still at a decent clip. So I'm out jogging one morning, and the only thing different now is I wear a heart monitor. So I'm jogging along at a pretty good pace, and literally, in mid-stride, I start feeling bad. I mean, really bad. So the first thing I do is I look down at my heart monitor, and it says, zero, zero. And I say, oh. <laughs> and before I could finish the word, my heart stops. The lights go out, and down I go. And since I'm in mid-stride, I go down knee, shoulder, face plant, and then BAM! My defibrillator goes off. Pops me up just like a cork. And I remember bobbling around, kind of half there, half not there, and BAM! It goes off again. Well, now I'm fully conscious. So I look down at my heart monitor, and there's a pulse. And then I look down at my body, and holy cow, it was a bloody mess. So my wife takes me to the hospital. And the cardiologist on call that day was almost more like an engineer. He opens up a laptop, plugs in my defibrillator, he starts typing away. And he's looking at it as he's typing. He goes, yes, yes, your heart did stop. And your defibrillator did shock you, not once, but twice. And yes, it brought, back, it brought you back to life. It's all good. And I remember looking down at my body and all the bandages and stitches. And I said, but doc, 
Doc, isn't it supposed to shock you before you hit the ground? <laughs> and he says, that's a good point. So he types away on his laptop, and he says, it's all fixed. I was good to go. So I go home, and I heal up, and guess what I go do? I go back to jogging. I am not a very fast learner. So I'm jogging along again one morning, and I start feeling bad. I mean really bad. But this time I have learned. I immediately stop. I look at my heart monitor, zero, zero. I say, oh. And before I could finish the word, bam, my defibrillator goes off. I mean, man, it is like a giant gong going off in your head. I'm fully conscious. I look at my heart monitor. There's a pulse. I go back to the same hospital. I actually get the same doctor. He plugs me in again. He looks at his laptop. He's typing away. This time he's smiling. He's smiling from ear to ear and goes, oh, this is good. Your heart stopped. Your defibrillator went off. It brought you back to life before you hit the ground. It's all good. And with that, he closes up his laptop. He looks me right in the eye. And he says, but Michael, your running days, they're over. Now, for a guy that's been literally running almost his entire life, this was some pretty tough news. So literally, for the next couple of weeks, I just kind of wandered around trying to put this all together. And this is when I came up with my new three philosophies of life. Number one, I was going to stay positive. And I was going to stay positive by concentrating on the things I could do, not on what I couldn't do. Number two, I was going to stay lean. I figured the leaner I was, the less work my heart had to do. And three, in order to stay lean, I was going to eat right and exercise as much as my failing heart could do. And over the next 12 years, this worked pretty well, except for the 10 heart surgeries in between. I lived a pretty normal life. And then, Four years ago, my heart started to really, really deteriorate to the point where it was working less than 20%. So Stanford put me on the heart transplant list in which I waited for 19 months. And then, August 11th, 2013, at 2 o'clock in the morning, I get that wonderful phone call. Hello, Mr. Volstead, you have the perfect heart. So my wife and I, we charge up to Stanford, and after 12 hours later of surgery, I come away with a brand new heart. Now, I am not sure what it was. I am not sure if it was all those tubes coming out of me, or if it was the 90 different drugs I was on, and all of the horrible side effects, or maybe it was because I no longer had my heart, and I had somebody else's heart. But for whatever reason it was, I was smiling on the outside, but I was in so much pain on the inside, pain that I had never experienced before. I was in so much pain that on the third night when I was in ICU, I'll never forget, it was 1 o'clock in the morning. I remember closing my eyes, and I had big old tears coming down my cheeks. And I said... God, if I'd known it was going to be this tough, I wish you would just let me die. I said that. Now, this is coming from Mr. Positive, who has literally spent the last 17 years doing everything humanly possible to stay alive. That's how much pain I was in. And as soon as I said that, I saw this image. And it was an image of a young man. And all I could see was the back of his head and part of his body. And he was glowing. And at first I said, holy cow, this is God. This is God. And then I remember thinking, holy cow, God, you kind of took me up on my offer a little quick. I don't think that was God. I truly believe that was my donor. And he was urging me on. And I found out 
But months later, my donor was a young man. And at that moment, everything became crystal clear. I woke up the next morning, and I was smiling, not only on the outside, but I was smiling on the inside. So much so that when the doctors came around that morning and said, Michael, do you think you could walk around the nurse's station? I walked around five times, the next day 10 times. And in 10 days, almost a record number, I was out of that hospital. And one of the things that was driving me to get out of that hospital was this. My son was playing in a traveling soccer team right next to Stanford, and I was determined to be there. I was 100 degrees that day. It was miserable, but I was there. Now, just because you're out of the hospital with a heart transplant, you actually have to live right next to the hospital for three more months. But every week got better. At week two, I walked two miles. At week three, I walked three miles. And at week four, I walked four miles. I was so proud of myself. I was awesome. And after three and a half months, my doctors allowed me to go home. And I looked at my doctors, and I told my favorite doctor, Dr. Pham. I said, Dr. Pham, I am soon going to be running again, and I'm going to be skiing. And as I said that, and he walked me out the door, he kind of patted me on the back and said, that's good, Michael, that's good. <laughs> well, at month five, I was jogging. And at seven months, I was skiing. I remember showing Dr. Pham that picture a couple weeks ago, and I think his eyes got this big. He said, you did what? And I said, Dr. Pham, I told you I was going skiing. And he said, but I didn't think you meant this year. But I did. And every month got better. Month eight got better. Month ninth got better. And then month 10 came. At month 10, my perfect new little world imploded on me. At month 10, my father, who I was very close to, passed away. At month 10, a very dear friend of mine found out that she had stage four cancer. And at month 10, I suffered a mild stroke and I lost eyesight in my left eye. And suddenly, when everything you see is blurry, life becomes blurry. And for the first time in my life, I was depressed. In fact, I was a little mad. It's like, how much more do you want from me? So I remember seeing one of my good heart transplant buddies. And I told her my whole story. And I'll tell you the truth, I was looking for some major sympathy. And she listened to my story very quietly, very patiently. And when I was all done, she stood up, she looked me right in the eye, and she said, Michael, you should be dead. In fact, you should be dead three times over. And yet here you are, you're still here today. So you lost your eyesight in one eye. Get over it. Get over it. <laughs> Get over it. I remember when she said that, I didn't know if I wanted to punch her or hug her. But I went home that night, and I thought about what she said. And you know, she was right. A heart is life, and eyesight is a quality of life. Now granted, granted, it is a huge quality of life. And it's a quality of life I still have not gotten used to. But today, just two months ago, I celebrated my two-month anniversary of a heart transplant. And today, I am with all of you, and most importantly, I'm with my family. So if I could leave you with two things today, it is this. Number one, stay positive. Concentrate on the things you can do, not on what you can't do. And number two, and most important, please think about becoming an organ donor. There is so many great people waiting for an organ. Today, here in the United States, there is over 20,000 people waiting for a heart. And this year, less than 2,000 will get one. That means the other 18,000 will either get much sicker or will probably die. People call me an inspiration or a hero, 
I totally disagree. The real heroes are the organ donors and the organ donors' family because they gave me life at the most important or difficult time in their life. So today's TEDx is all about opening doors. Become an organ donor because you could possibly open the door of life to multiple people.